In today's video, going to be filling out my Senate map, and this is probably going to be the last Senate map that I fill out before the 2018 midterms. The reason why I think this is probably going to be the last Senate map that I fill out is because I just don't see a situation where I'm likely to change my predictions on these competitive Senate races, even though there are so many competitive Senate races to talk about. At this point, we have a lot of polling data, fundraising numbers. I can go on and on at all of the different information that we have to make a solid prediction on these races, even though a number of them are going to be extremely close. The only way I'd make another prediction video after this is if one of the candidates in these respective races makes such a significant blunder where it alters what I think is going to be the result of those races, and then I'll make another one. But for all intents and purposes, at this point, this is likely to be my last Senate map prediction. So as you can see here, got 17 Senate races that I'm going to talk about as potentially being some of the more interesting or competitive matchups on the board. But before I go into that, I'd like to ask you to participate in another Twitter poll, which I'll link down in the video description as well as down in the comments section. Section if you'd like to participate. Got way more participation in my last poll than I ever expected. It was the first poll that I did on my Twitter account, and we got well over 2,000 people that participated in that poll. So thank you for those who did. I'll show you what this poll is going to be, and then also the results of that last poll and some different wording that I'm going to put into it so that in future polls, we can maybe get a little bit more of a competitive result. So I'm going to bring that up on the page here. So the current poll that we're going to be doing here over the next week is what is your guys' prediction on who will win the Senate in the 2018 midterms? Do you think the Democrats are going to get to that 51 senators mark or above, or do you think the Republicans are going to have 50 plus senators? And the reason why the Republicans only need 50 senators to win the Senate is because they have the vice presidential advantage, where if there is a 50-50 tie in the Senate, then the vice president uh, will cast the ballot to break that tie. And since he is a Republican, that gives the Republicans that advantage. So I'm just interested to see how you guys think that the Senate map is going to play out and who you think is going to have the advantage after the midterms. Nobody thought it was possible that the Democrats were going to have a, even a possibility of winning the midterms so overwhelmingly that they would get the advantage in the Senate. There was even talks that the Republicans we're thinking about the possibility of a supermajority at 60 senators. That's clearly not going to happen at this point. Uh, it's likely to be a very close finish one way or the other. And I'm interested to see how you guys will see it playing out. But also to look at our prior poll result, I probably should have rephrased this question. I should have asked, who do you think is going to win the 2018 Texas Senate race? Then I think maybe this would have been a more competitive result. Even with how it's uh, worded here, who would you vote for? I thought it was going to be a little bit more competitive than this. I didn't see O'Rourke running away with this one, getting 90% of that Twitter vote with over 2,000 votes. And also, when I first put this poll out there, I thought maybe I'd get 100 votes in total. So thanks to all of you who, are, who participated in this particular Twitter poll. I really appreciate it. And O'Rourke looking like he has massive support from the YouTube community and all of you who participated in this particular Twitter poll. So thanks for doing that. And again, I'll try to phrase these questions in the future so we get a more competitive result. I thought coming to this one, maybe O'Rourke would get 60 to 70% of the vote. He blew well past that, getting up to 90%. So now I'm going to go back and fill out my final Senate prediction map for the 2018 midterm. So I'm going to start with the states that might not be quite as competitive. And those are going to be states in the Midwest like Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and then getting a little bit further out of the Midwest in Pennsylvania, a little bit closer to the East Coast there. The reason why these aren't expected to be quite as competitive, even though they are states that Donald Trump was able to win, is because the Democrats have the incumbency advantage in each situation. Also, the polling data has been very favorable for the Democrats in these particular states as well. So we are going to be going ahead and giving these states over to the Democrats to start things off. And again, as the races get a little bit harder to predict, I'll probably spend a little bit more time in talking about why I think one candidate is going to win over the other. So now at this point, we're at 13 races here that are likely to be a bit more competitive, certainly than the four states that I just filled out and deserve a bit of discussion. Starting off here with the state of New Jersey, we have incumbent Bob Menendez, who does not have the greatest favorable numbers in New Jersey, which is why this is likely to be a more competitive race than you typically expect in the state of New Jersey. But Menendez in the polling has still 
Ben above Hugen, the uh, corporate executive Republican that's running against him in what's going to be a very strong year for Democratic voter turnout. And this is probably going to be the case in a lot of these states that I make a case for the Democrats particularly, is if there's a lot of districts in these states that have close competitive races where you'd expect increased Democratic voter turnout to try to get new representation in those congressional districts, that can have an effect with these other candidates that are Democrats on the ballot as well. I think that's probably more than enough to push Menendez over the line and gets him the win at the end here. It would be a big surprise if the incumbent Menendez wasn't able to keep New Jersey in what's expected to be a strong year for Democratic voter turnout. Now I want to turn to a couple of other states that I kind of bundle in a similar category, and that's Montana with incumbent John Tester and West Virginia with incumbent Joe Manchin. Both of these incumbent Democratic senators have pretty good favorable numbers, and in the polling, they've consistently been ahead or close to their competition, but in general, they have looked better in those polling numbers as well as with the fundraising, and like I already said, their favorable numbers are pretty solid at this point. So 538 has these two states with these incumbents having about an 80 to 90% chance of winning their respective elections. I tend to agree with that. It would be a surprise if these Democrats weren't able to claim and keep these seats, even though Trump did extremely well in these two respective states. Now I want to move over to the West Coast region of the country, one state over from that furthest West Coast state here in California. That's going to be Nevada. Likely to be a very competitive election in both Nevada and Arizona, but starting off here with Nevada with Jackie Rosen, the U.S. representative from Nevada's 3rd Congressional District, taking on incumbent Republican Dean Heller. The polling data has been very close between these two candidates, and really I feel like Dean Heller's best chance here is the fact that he is that incumbent. He has the name recognition. Other than that, all of the metrics in the state of Nevada are more favorable for the Democrats, especially if we look at recent major election years, uh, presidential election years over the past decade. The Democratic candidates have come through time and again, and even Clinton was able to come through against Trump in this most recent election. Obama doing a bit better in the prior two presidential elections than what Clinton was able to do. But again, a little bit more of a Democratic leaning state and also a state that has demographics that are continuing to look more favorable for the Democrats. The polling has been extremely close. Rosen has done a really good job of fundraising, and that's pretty much been the case across the board in all of these competitive Senate races where the Democrats have done a better job of fundraising than their Republican counterparts, which is helping their cause in these situations where it's really close. Democrats, they've been targeting this particular seat for a while now. They felt like coming into 2018, it was going to be one of their best chances at flipping a Republican seat. I think they're able to do that with Rosen in what should be a close election. And then moving down to Arizona, unfortunately for the Republicans, they don't have the incumbency advantage. Jeff Flake moving on. That opens up the door for Kirsten Cinema, who's more of a centrist Democrat. Perhaps that helps her in a state like Arizona, which tends to be a little bit more red leaning in general. We saw this state go for Trump by a slim margin over Hillary Clinton. On the Republican side, we have Martha McSally. So both of these candidates are uh, members of the U.S. House of Representatives. McSally from the second congressional district, Cinema from the ninth congressional district. Going to be really close as indicating by the polling numbers, but cinema has been, in general, doing better in the polling. And again, it's a situation where strong Democratic enthusiasm and turnout is likely to push this one over to the Democrats at the end of the day. All right, moving over to, let's go up to the state of North Dakota. This is actually pretty much every state from here on out, other than these special election results that I'll, I'll get to after North Dakota, are ones that are pretty much toss-up coin flip scenarios. But first, I want to talk about North Dakota. The Democrats have the incumbency advantage with Heidi Heidkamp, and the Republicans are challenging with Kevin Kramer, who is the U.S. representative at large uh, representative from this state. So he has proven he can win a statewide election in North Dakota. North Dakota, a Republican-leaning state, certainly, and a state that Donald Trump did very well in back in 2016. The things that are for the advantage of the Democrats in this one is that Heidkamp is an incumbent. She's fundraised extremely well in comparison to Kramer. But on Kramer's side, his advantages are this is a Republican-leaning state. And also, he's been looking pretty good in the polling data that's been coming out more recently. So for a while now, I've been in a situation where I felt like Kramer had the lean in this one, having the advantage. He made some remarks about the 
accusers in the Brett Kavanaugh situation where I feel like it probably wasn't in his best interest to make those remarks if he's trying to win over independent voters or those who have voted for Heidkamp in the past. Maybe that is a detractor to his candidacy and making this one a little bit closer. But still, at the end of the day, I feel like this is one where the Republicans can gain a seat and grab it from the incumbent Democrat Heidi Heidkamp. Going to be really close. We'll see how it plays out. But in terms of Republicans gaining over what is currently a Democratic seat, I think this is their probably their best chance in the state of North Dakota. All right. Now, just quickly to talk about these special elections. Minnesota, I feel like Tina Smith is going to get a big trickle-down effect of Amy Klobuchar as well as the governor's race in Minnesota where she's going to get a lot of that Democratic vote that's going to turn out. Also, there's a lot of competitive districts in Minnesota that are likely to see very strong Democratic turnout, so that'll boost her chances as well. So I see the Democrats claiming this in what is a blue-leaning state. And then the reverse situation here for the Democrats, they don't have that same type of advantage, even though it is likely to be much more competitive than the incumbent race there with Roger Wicker. The uh, In Mississippi here, Cindy Hyde-Smith running as the Republican and then Mike Espy as the Democrat. Again, likely to be a bit more interesting, but at the end of the day, it would be quite a surprise if the Republicans weren't able to keep that one and likely to have a trickle-down positive effect of those who vote for Roger Wicker, likely to help boost the special election Republican chances in that one also. All right, so now just five states left here. Again, likely to be very close races. We'll start out in Florida. The polling has started to look a bit better for Nelson more recently. I feel like Gillum being on the ballot for the Democrats is going to have a massive positive trickle-down effect for Nelson. Nelson isn't the kind of guy that really gets a whole lot of enthusiasm on the campaigning trail, but being down ticket from, or further down on the ballot, I should say, than Gillum and those people that go out and vote for the Democrat Gillum likely to also cast a ballot for Nelson. I think that's enough to probably push him over the line in what is going to be an extremely close race between the incumbent Democrat and the Current Florida Governor Rick Scott, who's challenging on the Republican side. This is probably the Republicans' best candidate to run in this particular race, given his name recognition, the fact that he has won statewide elections in the past, albeit extremely close races for those uh, governorships. But again, I feel like Bill Nelson, with the aid of Gillum on the ballot, is going to push Florida blue or continue to be blue going past 2018 into 2019. All right, now I want to move up to Indiana. And initially, I felt like Joe Donnelly was in a lot of trouble here going against Mike Braun. But the polling data more recently has come back very strong for Donnelly. He's done a good job in terms of his fundraising and what's going to be, again, a strong year for Democratic voter turnout. I think that Donnelly keeps Indiana. He's the incumbent in this race. That name recognition also isn't going to hurt his chances by any means. And then also moving over to Missouri. A very similar situation, although McCaskill, the incumbent Democrat, hasn't polled quite as well as what we've seen from Donnelly in Indiana. McCaskill going against Josh Hawley. And again, I sound like a broken record here, but in terms of fundraising, McCaskill has done a much better job than Hawley, and that has a positive influence. Another thing to keep in mind is Missouri has some marijuana initiatives on the ballot, which is likely to increase Democratic voter turnout. So at the end of the day, I think McCaskill is just able to eke this one out in what should be an extremely close race. I forgot to mention it. Another thing for Heidkamp is the fact that there's a marijuana initiative on the ballot as well, which probably helps her cause, but still, I don't think that that's enough for her to overcome what we're currently seeing in the polls where she's down quite a bit to uh, Kevin Kramer. And now moving down to the two last results here, I have the Democrats right now at 50, the Republicans at 48, and 538 currently has these leaning to the Republicans, but likely to be extremely close. If we're just going off of the polling data, Phil Bradison has generally been slightly ahead of Blackburn. And then in Texas, the polling data has had Ted Cruz slightly ahead of O'Rourke, but within the margin of error where you can make a credible argument on either side. Actually, in terms of fundraising, Bredesen hasn't done quite as well as Blackburn. That's one of the few situations where the Democrats haven't done as good of a job at fundraising in the Senate matchup, and that is in the state of Tennessee. But O'Rourke absolutely crushing it with fundraising. We've never seen anything like it with a challenger Democratic senator in a red state like Texas. The turnout that he's getting at these uh these different rallies that he's gone to. He just broke the record. He had 50,000 people show up to a campaign rally recently, which is 
the most that have gone to a campaign rally since Obama in 2008. So about a decade span there. And O'Rourke was able to have the most turnout, which is just unbelievable what he's been able to do, especially in terms of those small dollar donations, absolutely crushing it, kind of like Bernie Sanders was able to do, coming out of nowhere and getting that kind of support. It's been very similar to what we've been seeing from O'Rourke in the state of Texas. This is probably my pick where I'm going most out on a ledge. I think that O'Rourke in what's going to be a very strong year for Democratic turnout, I think that this being a midterm is also going to help O'Rourke's chances. That means you don't need quite as many votes to get to the victory in comparison to a presidential year. I think that plays well for what's a very enthusiastic base behind him. Also, Ted Cruz, he doesn't pull all that well in terms of favorability. So I think O'Rourke is going to take Texas. And then Bredesen in Tennessee, very popular former governor. The last time he ran a statewide election, he won every single county, which is absurd when you consider he's a Democrat in Tennessee. Very popular, uh, more of a centrist Democrat, which I also think can possibly help him in a state like Tennessee. And also the Republicans don't have the incumbency advantage in Tennessee either, which is going to make things a little bit tougher there. Uh, of course, Corker moving on and Blackburn coming in as the U.S., House of Representatives, 7th Congressional District member trying to run for the Senate seat. And again, going to be extremely close, but I think Bredesen is able to eke this one out in the end. And also the polling data is showing that he's generally done a little bit better in these polling results than what we've seen from Blackburn, which also gives me a bit of confidence that he can go on and win this one. So at the end of the day, my final Senate map for the Democrats is 52 to 48. Some may see this as a little bit optimistic and Perhaps it is. I'm putting a lot of emphasis on the fact that the primary voting data that we got showed just unprecedented enthusiasm on the Democrat side. Well over 4 million more votes cast in Democratic primaries than Republicans. And in general, if Democrats can just keep the primary votes about even with the Republicans, you'd expect on general election day the Democrats to have more votes than that. But the fact that they're already crushing it in the primary results, that's not even the general elections where Democrats tend to do a little bit better with that voter turnout, I think is a really strong positive sign for them. It's not just the polling data in the generic congressional ballot where the Democrats are doing well. It's actually, it's in the actual voting data that we've seen from those primaries. So we'll see how this plays out again after all the elections have been taken place and all of these races have been decided come back and compare to see how either accurate or inaccurate I was on this map. And again, guys, I'm interested in what you think is going to happen. So I'm just about to release this poll here where I want to know who you think is going to win the Senate in the 2018 midterms. Do you think the Democrats are going to have 51 plus senators or the Republicans are going to have 50 plus senators? I'm interested to see uh, your opinions on that. So thanks for stopping on in, guys, for this video. Subscribe for more. Hope to see you back here for future videos.